I'm Colin. And I'm Megan. And this is Pet Sitter Sitter Confessional, Confessional, an open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Time to Pet. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back. Today, we're so excited to have Becky Eberly on to talk all about her time as a pet business owner and her experience in growing and selling her business and some tips that she has for all of us if that's the direction that we want to go with ours. So, Becky, thank you so much for coming on today. Could you please uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Hi, Colin. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Yes, I'm Becky Eberly. I'm the former owner of Dog Days and Catnaps which is a a large pet sitting and dog walking company in Northeast Florida. Um, I'm also the uh, current owner of two other small businesses. One is a consulting business, uh, Becky Everly Consulting. Um, I help pet business owners with their uh, software and business processes. I work for one of the leading pet software companies. Um, And I also own a bookkeeping and accounting business. I help other service businesses with their finances, uh, financial reports, taxes. uh, That is called Bluestone Business Solutions. So that's what I'm doing currently. You started back in 2000. Why did you decide to, it was time to start your business then? Yeah, I was actually working in the finance and investments field uh, when I started Dog Days and Catnaps. Um, I was working for two different investment companies uh, in operations and also as a financial advisor. I had um, also gotten my uh, MBA in finance. So I was in the financial industry to begin, but I kind of learned that It just wasn't for me the hard sales of the financial advisor position and also just the uh, corporate work environment in general. Um, It just wasn't really my passion. I really loved small business more than than corporate business. So um, also at the time, I was volunteering for the uh, Jacksonville Humane Society. So that was a lot of fun. And I was living with my husband and my the uh, love of my life, my dog, Jake, who was an Alaskan Malamute lab mix. He's about 150 pounds. Mm. So we were, uh, you know, busy with him. He had some medical issues. So I was kind of working with my dog. I was volunteering at the Humane Society. I also grew up in a farm uh, in Virginia. We had tons of dogs there. So it seemed to be the appropriate time to start a pet sitting business. So believe it or not, I quit my, um, you know, High paying, sort of high paying corporate finance jobs to start a pet sitting company. Oh. So, yeah. And now you have all this background and this knowledge in training in business and financial sides too, which is one of the aspects that many of us struggle to understand. So, maybe some high level tips or information. How can we get better? at the numbers side of our business? Well, I think that a good software program definitely helps. Um, You know, whether you're using a pet software to help with your, you know, scheduling and reservations um, and revenue. But in addition to that, um, also just an accounting type software, you know, where you can potentially uh, download your bank transactions, keep it all organized. So I think really good systems and software can help. Um, That will help to generate your financial statements that will help to for you to see trends in your business. And basically, you know, just how are you in terms of your revenue versus your expenses? And what is your what is your profit? And maybe even what are you spending money on that, that you might not Uh, need to be spending money on. Of course, if you can cut that, then that will increase your profit. So just a bit of organization there. Software really helps. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who just, that's just not their strength, which is totally fine. Um, In that case, you know, certainly I would recommend outsourcing uh, your bookkeeping or accounting, or even, you know, if you're talking about other aspects of your business, if, if you don't understand social media, then really consider outsourcing it. Uh, you know, your role as the owner of your business really should be to focus on your core business and growing your core business. Um, When your business is small, you you sort of can do it all. You can do the core business, you can do the accounting, you can do the social media and marketing. Um, But once you get to a certain size, you know, don't feel bad about hiring a professional to handle the other aspects of your business of your business. It will help you to grow your business and focus on your, your core business. Yeah. Those two big aspects there, get organized and get help. 
There's so much yes. like just get it off of your plate. And especially if somebody is going a professional at it, that is going to be able to focus purely on that. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's really, that's really great. And you mentioned being able to focus and grow your core business. You grew your business to over 35 staff. How did that happen? What was that an intentional process or did you just kind of wake up one day and go, Oh wow, there are 35 people that work. For me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, it did happen gradually. I would say that I started the business with the uh, vision that I wanted it to be a pet sitting company. Um, I mean, nothing huge taking over the world or anything, but I, I didn't want it to only be me. So um, I knew that I wanted that. Um, and so I started out in October of 2000. And I went through my first holiday season as a solo pet sitter, which was a lot. <laughs> and that was enough for me to understand that I needed help. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did hire my first pet sitter in March of 2001. Um So after that, um, it was just gradual, but it was intentional. So, you know, I hired somebody in a certain area. I would do targeted ads in that area to help drum up more business for that particular pet sitter that I just hired. Um, I would always be the backup for that sitter in case there was some sort of scheduling or availability issue. Um, But after that, it really was just an intentional process of you know, looking at my service areas, um, where is my service needed? You know, where are the clients and pet owners calling in from and and where do I need to get a new person in place? Um, I would hire the new person and then just try to drum up more business in those particular areas. Um, So yes, gradual, but intentional. Right. I I like that of going, okay, like I'm getting a lot of calls or a lot of uh, connections over in this area um, does it make sense to to hire somebody just specifically over there? And then, as you said, once you have somebody in that area, you can focus marketing. You can start drumming up more because you are able to take on those people in that new area. Yes, absolutely. And I really made a point to um, not say no to any clients, especially in the beginning, mm-hmm. unless, of course, it was just an obvious, um, you know, problem or, or if they were not going to be a good fit for, for the company, you know, a very aggressive dog or something like that. And I guess in addition to just hiring in those areas um, and saying yes to the clients, you know, I, I also talked to everybody. Um, I lived in an apartment complex at that time. I, you know, put... Uh, pamphlets and flyers in these newsletters that um, go out to the hundreds of people who lived in, you know, lived in my apartment complex and also the complexes around uh, where we lived, spoke to vets, you know, to see if I could get on to uh, like a referral program with the veterinarians in the area. So just speaking with people, um, going to different events, you know, getting vendor booths at different events, um, believe it or not, um, And this is going to age me a little bit, but I did start the business in 2000. So my first advertisement was in the yellow pages, if you remember what the yellow pages were. (laughs) (laughs) I believe they were pages that were yellow in nature. (laughs) Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. And businesses placed ads in them. So so I remember the uh, like the phone book person came to my apartment and I placed the yellow pages ad. So that's a little funny. There was no social media or anything at that time. Uh, you know, but as the business grew and as the years went by, um, of course, you know, I had a website, promoted the website as much as possible, got online, uh, did social media, Google AdWords. Um, Google AdWords is nice because you can target it to certain uh, zip codes or parts of town and also different demographics. Um, and the conferences, you know, many of the pet sitting organizations um, have these conferences, PSI and NAPS. Um, I really found those to be invaluable just because you get to network with other pet sitting uh, companies. You get to meet other pet business owners, network with them, just talk to them about what they're doing. But there are are, uh, seminars, you know, at these conferences just with tips and tricks about how to do this or how to do that. So um, that was really invaluable to me to help grow the business and uh, get my processes down. Yeah. Now, as you're adding employees, did you have a set structure of of organization of people in the company, or was it um, did they just all report to you, or were they did they have their own groups of employees that stayed together and communicated with each other? Well, I did have um, two different managers, so you know, I guess in the last 
five or more years of owning the business, um, the sitters mostly reported to the managers. You know, I had a scheduler uh, reservations manager. So they were more uh, in direct contact with the pet sitters. I was always available, you know, always had an open door policy. If there are any issues, certainly, uh, you know, they could come to me or, you know, I might reach out to them. So, um, but yes, it was kind of, it was the pet sitters and then the two managers and then myself. And I would, you know, try to focus more on the high level uh, growth of the company, systems, processes, uh, marketing, things like that. Looking back, maybe what's one of your biggest takeaways or lessons that you've learned when when you were hiring people? I think it's so important to have a hiring process. So I would never just have um, open interviews. Um, I would always have a process where, you know, it would start with the initial uh, help wanted ad for the pet sitters. Um, in the help wanted ad, I was I would always have next steps. You know, here's what I need you to do. Contact me and give me this uh, XYZ information. So that was almost my first hoop that they had to jump through. So I would really only respond back to the people who basically followed the instructions in the advertisement that I placed for uh, staff. Um, once I replied to those people, um, I you know I would be very professional, say, thank you very much for getting back to me. Um, Here's what I need you to do next. And I would have a task in there. Oftentimes, it would be something along the lines of, you know, write a handwritten note about an experience you've had with a pet, Um, scan and upload this to me and, and return it back to me. So my husband always says that he would never work for me because he would not jump through all these, these hoops. <laughs> <laughs> However, you know, I did it for a reason because as you know, in, in pet sitting, the pet sitters have to be able to follow directions. And oftentimes, um, you know, it could be a life or death situation. You know, if you're giving the wrong medication um, to the pet, I mean, that could be a, a life or death um, issue. So they have to know how to follow instructions. Um, At the time, we were leaving handwritten notes in the client's home. So I did want to make sure that they could, you know, write legibly. I mean, I'm I'm just kind of pretending that I'm a client and that I would be receiving a handwritten note from this person. Um, Later, of course, in the business, we we used um, a pet software where we could do that online. We could email the uh, pet sitting notes, the pet care report to the clients. Um, But the part about just scanning and uploading and and emailing that... uh, paper, the handwritten note back to me, that demonstrated their technical abilities. You know, if, if you don't know how to, I know, I understand that not everybody has a scanner, but with a little bit of, you know, research, you can find out that there are lots of apps where you can just take a picture of a document and it turns it into a PDF and you can send it to somebody. So I wanted to just test out their technical abilities. Um, so, you know, once I received that and the communication was professional, um, then that's when I would uh, schedule the interview. Um, So I had a bit of a process for that. It was really a weeding out process. Um, In the early years, I did just interview anybody who applied and I just found that I wasted a lot of time. Um, So, you know, trying not to to waste my time any longer, I came up with the process and, um, you know, the interview itself, I really focused on the open-ended questions. and also just the situational questions. So, of course, open-ended questions really get the uh, applicant, the other person, to you know talk about themselves. Situational questions, you know, you can ask, okay, well, what would you do if if you were pet sitting and and something happened, you know, this happened to the pet, or what would you do if if there's an emergency and you can't get in touch with the client, or you know, just things that come up in pet sitting, you know, ask what would they do, and that's just kind of a scan for some just some critical thinking and some common sense on their part, which are um, crucial to, you know, being successful as a pet sitter. Yeah. And I love that you, that, that process, because you, you, you mentioned that being a pet sitter means being, having a high attention to detail. And many times we struggle with, well, how do I get them to answer a question when they were face to face that gets to me their level of detail orientedness without saying, you know, describe a time where you had to be detail oriented. Well, you, you know, wow. you can, you can get that, by having these these hoops, and it's very intentional. You know, the interview starts the moment they apply is effectively yes. what's going on here, and you're watching for all these little things 
and looking for those red flags that are going to come up of going, oh, they didn't include this or you know, this wasn't done professionally. This is a core of my business is communicating to clients in this way and they didn't do that well. And That's then, right. you know, you mentioned if they didn't have a scanner, they have, they've got a problem solve. So then you're starting to see how were they, how did they overcome this? Were they able to do some research and be a little bit independent on this? Because that's also really important, having a pet sitter out in the field. They're going to come across situations where they didn't expect it or it's new. How are they going to respond? What are they going to be able to do on their own without always reaching out for help? Exactly. Exactly. So I, I know that it must have seemed like a bit of a pain, <laughs> but these are just crucial issues that I need to make sure that pet sitters that I hire um, have, you know, that they're going to be capable. They're, they're going to be on their own. They're going to be, you know, entering the client's home by themselves. I'm not going to be there. You know, they can call me if they need to, but um, yes, it, it's just a test to make sure that they have these uh critical thinking skills. So that, that really worked for me. Yeah. Well, and it sets them up for success to work for you as well, because then you know you're getting people in that you're going to get along with, or you're going to be able to, to have set standards for, and they're going to yeah. be able to meet those. So all those expectations are kind of out there and pre-screened before, before they even start. Absolutely. Now, you were in the business for quite a long time. How did you keep showing up day after day? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is a long time. Um, first, I think that it really comes down to just a fundamental love for the pets that you're taking care of, and also just a love of helping others. Um, you know, it's it's really a caregiver position. You know, you really just have to enjoy the the pets that you're taking care of, and also how much you're helping out the pet owners as well. Um, but also, you know, a pet sitting business can be extremely flexible. So it's really not the same tedious job day after day. You can really make it yours. You can, you know, add services that you enjoy. Um, you can not provide services that, that you don't want to provide. Um, I'm a big advocate of firing your bad clients. Mm. So <laughs> if they're not a good fit for your business, you know, um, then don't don't work for them. Don't provide service for them. Of course, you need to be uh, professional in that conversation. Um, you know, you don't want to have them get their feelings hurt. You know, you need to have an explanation for that. But they probably feel it as well if, if you're, you know, if it's not working out on your end. But, you know, they say that 20% of people or 20% of the clients cause about 80% of your problems. Mm -hmm. So by all means, if, if something is not working out, um, you know, get rid of the clients that are causing the 80% of those um, problems. So um, in addition to that, I mean, you know, with the pet sitting business being very flexible, you can, um, you know, add complimentary services. Uh, you can add grooming if you want to. You can add poop scooping, training. You know, if you're not able to do these things, then certainly hire somebody uh, who is qualified. Um, in it was around 2006 or 2007, I actually bought a doggy daycare and a boarding facility uh, out at the beach where I live in Northeast Florida mm -hmm. um, to just to complement the pet sitting and the dog walking service, uh, which worked out very well. You know, I found that there really are two different types of clients. Um, obviously, the clients that were using us for in-home pet sitting and midday dog walking and overnight pet sitting where we would travel to the client's home. That's kind of one type of person or type of client where they want that in-home experience. Mm -hmm. I found that there are plenty of other clients who were not really comfortable with that and they much preferred to bring their dogs to a location. Um, so we offered the doggy daycare, um, you know, just for the day, usually Monday through Friday, and then the overnight boarding. It was a cageless boarding facility. So it had a homey feel, kind of a beach house for dogs feel. Um, and I found that it just complemented the, the in-home pet sitting part very well, because then I could offer different services for different types of clients. So I think just because it's so flexible and you can make it yours, make it what you want, um, that's, that's how it's very easy to, to show up every day. Yeah, you know, your emphasis there on adding services, you enjoy make it what you want it's your 
business, don't try and make it something that it's not or that you don't want it to be because then it's hard to show up for that. You know, it's hard to show up and work hard and pour all of your passion into something that's not yours, that that you that doesn't align with things that you want to be doing. So I, I, I love that you said, you know, make it what you want it to be because that's what's going to be able to allow, keep you coming back day after day. That's right. That's right. And there's really no mold that you need to fit into. You don't need to offer the same exact services at the same prices that everybody in your community is doing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, really focus on your strengths and and what you want to do, Yeah, what you would enjoy. And you mentioned there that a key aspect that too was firing your bad clients. What did that process look like for you? And you know, how many did you did you find yourself doing that a lot, or was that something that you only had to implement a few times? I, I really only had to implement that a few times. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't tolerate certain things if there was any sort of abuse, you know, towards me or towards a pet sitter. That was almost just an immediate, you know, we we can't work with you uh, type of situation. Um, and, and I was, I tried to be very in tune to my staff. You know, they're working for the business as well. I want them to be happy. If they're happy and if they feel supported, they're just going to do a much better job for the company uh, and for the clients. Um, so it wasn't very often, but in cer- certain situations, um, yes, I would just have to call the client and explain the situation and say, I, I just don't think that we're, we're a good fit. Um, and depending on the situation, you know, there's a possibility you could refer them to another pet sitter, but I certainly, you know, another pet sitter in, in town, but not if it's like an abusive type situation or if there's any sort of like animal abuse, um, you know then that certainly would not be a a referral situation. But um, yes, I think you have to have your standards. You really just want to be working with the the people that appreciate your service um, and also that you can do a good job for. Yeah, have the standards, have those lines in the sand so that you know when those are crossed that you have recourse, that you are not going to tolerate that. Because that's going to tell people what your business stands for. And you know, you also mentioned looking out for your staff too. How are they being treated? Do they feel safe? Are they comfortable? Do they have concerns? And listening to them and being open to, to getting feedback and, and then acting on that as the owner. Yes, absolutely. Have you heard about Time to Pet? Doug from Bat to the Bone Pet Care has this to say. Time to Pet has made managing my team and clients so much easier. Our clients love the easy to use app and scheduling features and our sitters love being able to have all of their information organized and easily accessible. My favorite feature is the instant messaging. By keeping conversations on Time to Pet, we are able to monitor our team and ensure nothing ever falls through the cracks. If you are looking for new pet sitting software for your business, give Time to Pet a try. As a listener of Pet Sitter Confessional, you'll get 50% off your first three months when you sign up at timetopet.com slash confessional. So after 17 years, uh, you sold your business. How did you know it was time for that to happen? Right. Yeah. I really felt that I had experienced all the stages of my business. Um, as I mentioned, I started as a solo sitter. I went through the the growth stage, the hiring, the advertising. Um, we expanded into new services, different service areas, the, the doggy daycare. Um, we were well into six figures revenue, um, two managers, over 35 pet sitters. Um, in addition to that, I had already started with the pet software company, and I was happy helping other pet sitting business owners with their business processes, uh, with their software. Um, and I knew that I wanted to return to my financial roots eventually. So I just felt that it was time to kind of pass pass the torch. Um, I was looking for new challenges. Um, yes, and I ended up selling the business to just a fabulous new owner who's a great guy and and um, sold it for for over six figures as well so it was uh, it was a nice nice experience yeah yeah so it, it sounds like you were pretty emotionally prepared for that did, did you was did it impact you uh, on an emotional level to to sell your business and watch it pass on to somebody else uh, and out of your hands 
I think it did. Yes. Um, now I had um, thought about selling it for several years. And like I said, I was kind of moving on to other things, but you know, your business is really like your baby. I mean, you, you know, you start the business, you're, you're so just personally invested and involved in your business. Um, I really wanted to find somebody who would get the gravity of that um, and really understand that, um, you know, I guess I wanted to see that they wanted to continue the good customer experience for our customers. So I wouldn't let it go to just somebody who, who was really interested in, in maybe making a lot of money or, you know, if there was a situation where they were in a bind and they were hoping this business would get them out of their bind. I really wanted to find somebody who at their core um, understood the clients, understood the service, would continue that good um, customer experience and just provide a great service for the pets and our care. So I really felt that um, I was attached to it. I was. And I, and I was looking for that perfect buyer. Well, so. I'm, sure, I'm sure that made it easier for you too, knowing you had the perfect buyer in mind, right? And then you could see, oh. is this do is this who I would want to take care of my clients? Is this who I'd want yes. taking care of my clients too? Um, yeah. That's so, right. Higher business. So yeah. he bought the, the LLC. It wasn't just the client list. Um, it was the whole company, the LLC, all of the processes that had been developed over 17 years, um, all of the paperwork, the manuals, um, the staff, the managers. We had an office that was a leased space. So the office came with the business as well. Um, all of our trade secrets, the name, the brand, um, everything, the whole company. So um, essentially, you know, at first I had listed the business for sale with a business broker. And that was for maybe, um, six to nine months or so that it was uh, for sale with a business broker. And I got some leads and I did get an offer, but it just didn't feel right. Um, there was a, a bit of a contingency where some of the sales price was contingent upon future sales, mm. where we already had 17 years of proven processes and sales. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not a fortune teller. I can't tell what's going to happen in the next year, sure. <laughs> you know, COVID as an example. So. Um, I didn't want to go into a, a business relationship like that. So, so that contract with the business broker uh, lapsed and, and I decided just to kind of hold on to the business for a little while. Um, I actually ended up um, listing the business for sale on my own. It was through an um, online marketplace called bizbuysell. Dot com. So it's where you know people can buy and sell their businesses and list it. So there's a, a small listing fee. Um, but I basically wrote everything up. I, I um, came up with the financial reports based on my you know revenue and expenses and the, everything that was in the software. Um, and that is actually how I found the the new owner. So he contacted me through bizbysell.com and um, we went from there. Yeah, we just started a conversation and he had an attorney that was, you know, helping out with the uh, paperwork with the sale, you know, all of the um, the paperwork that's required, all of the contracts and all of the, uh, you know, reviewing all of the financial information. Um, so just a little bit of um, him getting to know the business, getting to know me, um, you know, looking at and also verifying all of the financial information, looking at our pet software that we used, uh, you know, looking at the schedule, the past schedule, the upcoming schedule, the revenue, the staff, you know, just everything. Um, and then we, you know, just decided on the sales price and really, you know, it was mostly his attorney that he had, but I, you know, of course I hired my own attorney, um, but at least, you know, there's no business broker involved. The business broker was helpful in my experience, but they take such a large cut of your sales price. Mm -hmm. So I was thrilled to only have to pay the small fee to the, the relatively small fee uh, to the attorney, as sure. opposed to a big chunk to the business broker. Yeah, it really sounds like it's it's a really deep dive and you're going to be combing through every aspect of your business. So having all that up front and do that ahead of time so that it's all on the table sounds like it really saved possibly a lot of time and work on both of your, your ends. 
Yes, absolutely. I think if you're considering selling your business, you really need to be organized. You need to have all of your financials um, and all of your business processes documented, I would say at least for the the previous three years. Um, A new buyer is going to want to come in. They're going to need to verify all that information. So Something huge is that you you really and this is you know an accounting principle you have to keep your business and personal finances separate so it'll really cause some problems if a new buyer looks at your business and you show them maybe your bank statements or you know your QuickBooks file and it's just all um, a mixture of your business expenses and your personal home mortgage payment you know don't do that <laughs> you. <laughs> You have to have a separate business account, only have your business revenue going into that account, pay all of your business expenses through that account. It has to be verifiable to, an, uh, to a third party. Mm. Um, and also just in, uh, in addition to, like I said, the uh, documented schedule, the documented pet sitters, the documented revenue that's in your uh, pet software. Most of that doesn't just happen overnight. So if you are thinking about selling your business, start really early and getting yes. all of that because you know it mentioned the past past three years. I have a hard time remembering what I did a couple months ago, let alone where my business was three years ago, unless I start taking good documents and and writing things down now. So really yes. making sure all those ducks are in a row before that process even gets started. That's right. Now, as you're going through this, how did you communicate this transition to your existing clients? So, you know, for the the very regular, the very good clients that I had a personal relationship with, um, I I reached out to them personally and I told them um, that, you know, there's going to be a a change in ownership. Um, At that point, you know, later in the business, before I sold it, I really wasn't doing a lot of uh, pet sitting myself. So from early on, um, you know, I really wanted our clients to have a great experience with the company. So I tried to remove myself personally, because as you probably know, you know, the clients can get really attached to their pet sitter. Mm -hmm. So knowing that in the future, at some point, I might want to sell my business, I, in a way, wanted to sever those personal ties Um, knowing, of course, that I had a very good, very well-trained, very capable pet sitter who was taking care of their pets, but I would just take myself personally out of that. Mm -hmm. So a majority of our clients really did not have a personal relationship with me as far as me going into their home and taking care of their pets. So that made it a lot easier. And like I said, for the people who I did have that close relationship with, I they, they really didn't have a problem. They, in a way, they trusted me to um, do the right thing uh, for the company, but as a result for them. So they trusted me that I would uh, find the right buyer that would take care of their pets, that would take care of them. Now, did you have any sort of, of pushback or concern communicated to you from those clients? I know you said that many of them trusted you and had faith that you were doing right by them. Was there any sort of concern mentioned uh, through that process? Surprisingly little. Mm. Um, I really don't recall anyone contacting me saying they're very concerned. They're you know afraid the business is going to fall apart. Um, none of that. I think they knew that we had a you know very well oiled machine and they were happy with the service. And mm. I think a big part of that is that their pet sitter was not going to change. Right. So you know I wasn't going to be the owner any longer. There was going to be a new owner manager. But in a way, that really didn't directly affect them. Um, The pet sitters were continuing to work for the company, even though I was, you know, stepping down as the owner and there's going to be a new owner. So we really tried to not make a big deal of it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there was a, a decent training process. You know, once the business was sold, I was still around. You know, there was a training period of several weeks. Um just to ensure that the new owner knew what was going on. He was familiar with all the um, processes. The two managers also are still to this day working for the company. So they were really hands-on with the clients as well. So the clients kept their pet sitters. The clients kept the reservations manager who they were used to communicating with, you know, via email or phone. So none of that changed for them. 
and to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if several clients didn't even notice. Sure. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Why, why would they? If so, if their pet yep. continues to be taken care of, like they would have no need to understand what's happening up at the top. Up at the top. <laughs> exactly. That's and, right. And so you mentioned I was I was curious about this. If what kind of what that transition looked like, and so you you stuck around and and helped train the new owner uh, on the business and how it functioned. What was that like? What what kind of things did you talk to him about? What, uh, what, what things did you cover and, and how involved were you after that sale? Well, it was written in the contract that for two weeks, I would provide um, basically full-time training. Hmm. So that's what we did. It, it turned out not to be full-time. Um, you know, we have the company to, to manage and the pets to take care of. And, um, you know, I have three kids at home. He has two kids. So... <laughs> <laughs> We were doing different things. So it was probably more like three or four weeks. But to be honest, you know, and that was, like I said, that came with the contract. But I I wasn't too concerned about me taking off and leaving. You know, I was more than happy to help him wherever he needed. Um, And even to this day, we keep in touch and we talk about about business stuff. Uh, If he has a question about a staff person or policy or, or what would I do in that situation? So, um, you know, my, I really want the company to be successful for the clients and also for him. Sure. Well, and as you mentioned, you had the perfect buyer in mind. And so when you found that person, you know, you, you, you still want to see that person succeed, the clients taken care of. And so, you know, you're, you're still involved. It sounds like a little bit emotionally in that and wanting to see them be successful and help out where you can. Right. And that, that's yeah. just, that's just because of the relationship that you have with the new owner. It's because you went through that process and you did it the way you did. It's, it sounds like it's kind of just natural for you to want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to do it. Um, you know, if he were to approach me and say, okay, can you help me with this big project that, that would probably fall under, you know, my consulting business where I might charge him, you know, extra for that, for that, uh, service. However, just, you know, a quick question here, or what would you do there? Uh, it's been a really nice transition, um, because, you know, he's interested in, in success of the company and I'm interested in having him be successful at the company so he can continue it on. Yeah. What do you think made that transition so smooth? Looking back at that, what was it about either the process or the things you had in place that helped that be as smooth as it was? Yeah, I think it was everything that I had in place. Um, I'm extremely organized when it comes to that. I'm just naturally a a planner. Um, And I, I think it was just basically creating a turnkey operation. Hmm where a, a, somebody else, a third party, a, a you know, new owner could literally just walk into the business on day one and say, okay, well, here's how we do new client consultations. And if a, if a client contacts us, what's our process? And, you know, so just having literally everything documented. And, you know, certainly I don't want to be inflexible. I mean, you know, in pet sitting, sometimes you need to be flexible and <laughs> clients need certain things that you haven't you know, you haven't come up with a process for, but um, yes, just creating that turnkey organization. Um, I really advocate for having a, a software for your, you know, client list, for your staff list, for your schedule, uh, for your services and your prices, for your revenue. So keep organized there so someone else can literally just log in and basically see the operations of your company. Um, and also just have your financials in order. You know, you need that uh, profit and loss statement or income statement. Um, you need your balance sheet. You need your separate uh, business account, uh, just all verifiable. So organization uh, is key. Yeah. And the part about being organized is it doesn't just help people in the future. Like it helps you here in the here and now yes. run, run the best business that you can. So it's a good idea whether you're thinking about selling your business down the road or not, just to get organized because all those things are beneficial and will help you run a better business. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because I always say, you know, the one thing that cannot happen in pet sitting is that you just you forget to show up to a to let a dog out or to mm-hmm. a consultation. So not even just thinking about selling your business, but you're you're absolutely right. Just in operating your business, um, you have to have these systems in place 
where it's nearly impossible for you to miss a visit or for one of your uh, staff members, pet sitters to miss a visit. So, you know, use a software, you know, have those email confirmations, the text message confirmations, you know, confirm it with the client, just everything you can do to to have it in front of you on your calendar um, and get those pop-up notifications. Um, Yeah, have all of that in your processes. Uh, That'll thousand percent help your, your operations. Sure. Now, after you sold, you made a transition and actually opened up a, a small brick and mortar boutique. What was that? Trans- what was that transition like for you? We're all about transitions today, I guess. Um, what What was the thinking behind wanting to go and try a brick and mortar shop? Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I I think I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur if I were to be honest. So (laughs) I love just the planning and organizing of starting a business. Um, And also just, you know, while you're operating the business, I just love the organizing the financials, looking at the financial reports. I loved the um, point of sale system for the gift shop, the inventory. I know that might sound crazy to some people, but it's just how my brain works. So um, (laughs) I live in, I've said I lived in Northeast Florida. I live in St. Augustine, Florida, which has a really nice um, historic downtown area, Uh, a bit, you know, touristy, but also it has a nice local vibe and there's a lot of um, fun gift shops and and buy local, you know, um, Mm -hmm. shops. So we just as a family went down there um, often to eat lunch and and do a little shopping. so it was just something that I wanted to try. It was it was a new challenge for me because the pet sitting business, um, you know, not including the doggy daycare, but the pet sitting that that's really where you are traveling to the customer. Um, the gift shop was a lot different because I had the location; all of the customers were coming to me. So it was just kind of a, a flip. You know, I liked that I could have the location, and um, I didn't have to travel all over town to do my, my job. So, (laughs) um, which I think actually can be one of the perks of having a a dog walking business. It is nice to be out of the office and be able to travel around and let the dogs out. But, but this was just new. It was just a new challenge for me. Um, so that's, you know, that's what I thought about as I was selling the business. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a small boutique gift shop. Um, I did have a section in the gift shop for pet treats and pet supplies, of course. Um, but it was, it was a lot of other things as well. Um, and I really just enjoyed the startup of it. And like I said, that point of sale system where, you know, you, you have your barcode and you check people out and, and just stocking the inventory, displaying the inventory and uh, just tracking the inventory. Uh, we used Square point of sale, um, but they have, you know, there's lots of different software systems for sure. your, your inventory. So a lot of fun. Yeah. And what I find an interesting tie in here is that many pet sitters and dog walkers are starting to add merchandise and starting to bring in inventory during times of during COVID uh, to Mm -hmm. supplement their income. So having gone through managing inventory and, and merchandise in a physical location, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's thinking about doing that? Um. You know, one of the things that I struggled with is that I wanted to buy too much inventory, Um, not just too much, but um, too many different things. Mm. And it got a little bit confusing, I think, not just for me, but I think also for the customers coming into the store. You know, you kind of walk in and you're like, wait, let me take this all in. You know, what is this shop? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's like so much stuff in here. Um, so I went a little crazy with my inventory. Okay, I'll admit it. Um, but I, I think especially if it's just a small area, you know, maybe in a doggy daycare or in a grooming facility, um, I would recommend trying to focus in on just a handful of products. Um, because, of course, with each product, I mean, if you're thinking about um, pet clothing or leashes, you know, you have the product, but you're going to have all sorts of different sizes and all sorts of different colors. So even one product can have a a, a huge area of display in your, in your shop. So, you know, just 
take note of how much inventory you're buying. I try to specialize in uh, one type of product, you know, maybe one or two or three types of products. But um, I would say, you know, don't don't go crazy with the inventory like that. <laughs> well, yeah, especially if you're just starting out, be as focused as possible. Look, at, maybe you look at what kind of requests or cu- questions you get from your existing clients and see where you can add and fill in the gaps there. And and yeah, if you're not used to managing physical, tangible items, I can imagine how overwhelming that would be. And I know my initial impulse would be, yeah, let's get it all in. I just I'll just yes. four of everything, and we'll I'll be able to meet everybody's needs. And then right. trying to unpack and find places for all that in your store. Would right. really probably it would drive me crazy trying to do that the right way. <laughs> yes. So, so start yeah. small and, and see where you can f- really find a need. Is it really sounds like what you're what you're saying here is is just stay focused, be adaptable to what your clients are asking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because people definitely did come into the shop and they asked us if we had certain items. And believe it or not, one of the most popular items that people asked for were um, socks, like specifically. Christmas socks and Christmas ornaments. Even in July, they come in July and they'd say, do you have any Christmas ornaments or Christmas socks? And I'm thinking, what? (laughs) It's July. But um, I think, you know, they're collector's items. People travel in the summertime and wherever they go. Um, I do the same thing with magnets. You know, every time I go someplace, I just grab a magnet. Um, A lot of people do that with uh, Christmas ornaments. Mm. So um, maybe if you do have a little retail spot, you might want to consider getting some pet uh, Christmas ornaments. They probably would sell. Um, But yes, so listen to the customers coming into the shop for sure. So um, maybe go with your gut, uh, order the few things that you definitely want to have in your shop, but, you know, keep a little space for the things that people ask for. You certainly want to provide um, to your customers what, what they want. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just so that, so that you're meeting their needs. And again, you know, we try and do that with our own, uh, pet services and you know need to continue to do that with the products that we're thinking about bringing in. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I think, you know, the location is important as well. Um, if it's just an add on to a, another shop that you have, you know, that is your location. But if you're looking to add a, a separate location, definitely um, think about the location. We were in our gift shop, we were about uh two blocks away from the main pedestrian um, street. Mm. It was, uh, you know, that's where everybody, it, it's a street, but it's closed off to traffic and that's where all the, the uh, shops are. So we were very close and we did have, um, we were close to a parking lot where a lot of people parked and they walked to the main pedestrian street. Um, but even though it was close, we didn't do nearly the amount of sales that the people did on that main pedestrian uh, walk. So sure. definitely just think about the location, even a couple of blocks away could make a big difference. Um, but you do also have to think about your expenses. We certainly were not paying the rent, uh, that the people were paying on the main pedestrian street. So, you know, you kind of have to take, take the anticipated revenue, but also the, uh, anticipated expenses that you're going to pay. Yeah. So think about them. The location, yeah. yeah. Pros and cons to to all things in life and in business. It turns out, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, thinking about um, just pet care providers, what would be your number one piece of advice for them? This is a tough one. I mean, you know, I've talked a lot about just the processes and the the day to day, the operations, the financials, the software. I think even before you get to that. Um, you really have to work on your your mindset. I would say that I would really want other pet business owners to just approach your business with integrity mm. and purpose. You know, do right by your clients, their pets, and also your staff because you really just need to give to get. So, you know, be a good business owner. Um, be good to your clients, to your staff. It will reflect greatly upon you and your business, but also just the pet sitting industry in general. Uh, we've all heard nightmare stories about, you know, quote unquote, bad pet sitters. So we, we certainly don't want to be that. And, and in the pet sitting industry, we want other pet sitters around the, the country and in our neighborhoods to, um, to be offering a, a good um, service as well. 
Um, just, you know, take care of yourself. I think it's so important to exercise, to eat well. Um, don't let yourself get burnt out. In my experience, so many people are, are a little scared, afraid of hiring staff. Um, don't be afraid to hire staff. You know, I guess have confidence in yourself that you are going to be able to train that person. You know, you're not the only person that can pet sit for the clients. I know they'll make you think that way <laughs> and feel that way, but you can train other people to do an excellent job. And as a matter of fact, you know, when I stepped away from doing most of the pet sitting in my company, um, the clients loved the pet sitters even more than they loved me. And I was kind of like, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought I was your favorite pet sitter, but they would just reach out to me and were saying, Becky, oh, she's so wonderful. Thank you so much. And mm. so on one side, I was not really hurt, but a little hurt. Sure. Um, <laughs> but I felt so good that they were a thousand percent comfortable with the people that I was sending to them. Mm. So, you know, don't be afraid to hire people, get the help. Um, that you need so that you're not burnt out. You know, you have to take a vacation. You have to have some time off or you're not doing anybody any favors. Um, you know, the, you're not going to be good for the clients, for the pets, if you're burnt out. And if you start not enjoying your job. Um, and, you know, if you are a little afraid of hiring staff or doing something in your company, just remember that saying, uh, I love this quote, feel the fear, but do it anyway. Mm. So. So many people are are afraid. Everybody's afraid of something. You just have to feel it and you have to make a plan and do it anyways. So have your vision for the company um, and and do what you need to do and just feel the fear and, and do it in, anyway. Good systems in place. I already spoke about that. Um, and yeah, just have a vision for your business. Have confidence in yourself um, and just don't let those day-to-day problems and issues distract you. You know, sometimes those clients, the the 20% of the clients who are causing all of these issues, they'll they'll distract you and they'll get you off of your vision. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, try not to let that happen. Just be confident in your your own capabilities. You can do it. Yeah. I love that. Now, I I, want to know, after all that you've done and are doing from from running a pet business to the consulting from a boutique, what does the future hold for you personally? Uh, Well, like I said, I think I am, you know, an entrepreneur at heart. So I certainly wouldn't be surprised if I started a new business. Not quite sure what that might be. Hmm. I'm... um, I've recently started the bookkeeping and accounting business. So I'm in the planning and the growth stage of that. So I'm really enjoying that and really enjoying helping, um, you know, the other service business owners with their finances. So it wouldn't be anything immediate, but um, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if I came up with, with something else in the future, another business that I haven't done yet. So, uh, so we'll see what that might be. I'm also really interested and in thinking about um, possibly writing a book. Um, I'd love to get all of this experience into a book, um, specifically to help other um, pet sitting business owners, maybe just other um, business owners in general. Um, so those are two things that, that might be coming up in the near future. Well, those are very exciting, and I will be on the lookout for both of those uh, and see what you've got coming down the pipeline. Uh, Becky, this has been extremely uh, eye-opening to hear about your experience and just wonderful hearing about how you stress the importance of being process-oriented, being organized, and not being afraid to do something different, something new, and yet knowing when it's time to move on to new things. I love that part of your story, and I know There's so much more here and you've got a lot going on. So how can people get in touch with you, ask questions and find out more? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to to chat. Um, My email address, the the best one to use would be Becky Eberly Consulting at gmail.com. So if anyone wants to reach out and um, ask about my experiences or if you have a quick question about um, your business or anything like that, I'm, you know, happy to help with that um, consulting, or if you're interested in in outsourcing your finances, we can have a discussion about that as well. So Becky Eberly Consulting at gmail.com. Wonderful. Again, Becky, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on today. You're welcome. It's been fun. Thank you so much. So what are the next steps in the life of your business? Where do you see yourself moving to in the future? 
What I love about Becky's story is that after 17 years of running a very successful business, she knew it was time to move on to something else, to do something different. And recognizing that that's okay and that we can make those kind of decisions in our life when we want to make changes, we can make changes. And that that is part of evolving as a business owner, as operating a business, and just at a personal level too. Let us know where you see your business moving and the kind of things that you're working on and towards in your business. You can send us an email at feedback at petsitterconfessional.com or check out our website or Instagram and Facebook at Petsitter Confessional. We'd like to thank Time to Pet for making this week's show possible. Go check out timetopet.com forward slash confessional for that discount. Thank you so much for listening this week. We'll be back again soon. Bye.